No? Yeah? Okay, I, I want to thank uh, this very interesting presentation. Um, I am a radiation oncologist and I want to ask Dr. Koller that you have presented 18% of your cases receive radiation therapy. I, we know that sometimes uh, when we have some risk factor, radiation therapy can help to avoid these local recurrences. And in our hospital in Valencia, in Spain, we saw before this lab trial that we had more recurrences that, than expected when compared with the old criteria for radiation therapy. I mean all that are sad list criteria. And we compare it with Korea criteria. Maybe you know that the Korean group has proposed other risk factors to add radiation therapy. I'd like to know if in the LAC trial, these aspects have been uh, studied, uh, but uh, in, in your experience, really, uh, you show that things can be good if uh, we can uh, work all together. I don't know if radiation can help or it is a different uh, issue. Thank you so much for this uh, interesting question, but again, I don't want to open this box of Pandora. Uh, I mean, this uh, seedless criteria is an unbelievable matter of debate since its, its appearance, and it's now a very old study, and we don't have any new data. Again, we did analyze and we accepted the decision of the tumor board within our study, and that's, these are the background of the data. I hope we get some newer, some newer um, parameters in the future to overcome this uncertainty, should we keep with the seedless criteria or not. I agree with you, they are very old, uh, but we don't have a, a better randomized trial that, that has ever, ever shown better results. So let's, let, let's see. This discussion was a huge, took us a huge time during the ESGO guideline meeting in Prague under the leadership of David Tibula. Should we keep this criteria in or not? Again, uh, a lot of, of us believe in better criteria, but we don't uh, have accepted up to now. Let's see. I cannot answer you the questions. Got a question for Pedro. I think, I think you, as I said, opened the eyes for uh, everybody of us. So now there is a problem. And what would you recommend to, to the audience, to people who are busy with robot or want to start with it? How shall we proceed from now with these data? And what would be, with your expertise, with your insight, the best recommendation for us? Sure. So I'll, I'll tell you first what we did in our institution in, uh, in October of 2017. So almost coming to two years ago, when we learned of the results of the lag trial, we as a department made the decision to stop all minimally invasive surgery for cervical cancer. We are 23 gynecologic oncologists, um, and based on the results of this data, we stopped and we no longer offer minimally invasive surgery. I think it's, it's important to look at the information that we have. I mean. When we evaluate our clinical practice, we look at the different levels of evidence. We look at a prospective randomized trial differently than retrospective data. We look at a survey differently than retrospective data. We know and we call re prospective randomized trials level one evidence medicine. So if there is a prospective randomized trial that has been balanced in both arms, and that is consistent with the standard practice for adjuvant therapy indications, then we need to look and question whether what we have been doing has been the correct thing to do. I think this has not been a situation where there is one trial that shows a finding and everything else shows something different. This is one trial, prospective, randomized, level one, published in the highest scrutiny journal in medicine. It's, 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 a, it's a significant level of scrutiny of how these articles go through review, statistical analyses, multiple statistical analyses, data requests. So this is prospective, randomized data that is not standing alone. There are multiple other studies beyond that that show exactly the same thing. So I think that in looking at that and in evaluating that, then continuing to consider that the minimally invasive approach may be okay because 
with reasons like, well, my own personal opinion or in my hospital. If we're going to start practicing medicine when we are refuting all prospective randomized data, data that is consistently showing the same thing, then let's not read any articles, let's not go to any conferences, and let's just do whatever we like and whatever we feel is fine. But we have to look at data and we have to evaluate that data and move forward with the change. You know, I think that it's interesting that if the LAC trial had shown that minimally invasive surgery was superior, I don't think anybody would have had any problems and we had just moved on. Uh, we have had recent trials, the LIONS trial, looking at not doing lymph node dissection in ovarian cancer, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. There was no issue. Everybody just said, all right, we stopped doing lymph nodes for ovarian cancer. When we added bevacizumab to carboplatinum and taxol for recurrent cervical cancer, nobody had a problem. They just said, okay, it's a prospective randomized trial, well conducted in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's practice changing. We got to start adding bevacizumab. But there has been a significant amount of energy about this that is propagated often by no data at all, just personal opinion, personal editorials. And you have to think, it's not about your surgical preference, it's not about the training that you spent, it's not about how much money you spent in training, it's about the patients. And if multiple trials show that this is not good for patients, we should stop. Thank you. My name is Artem. I'm from Armenia, gynecologist. I have a question to Pedro. Uh, you told that you are uh, able to gain the data about the, the, the uh, uterine manipulators and the, the intra-abdominal colpotomies. So are you planning to collect this data, to analyze and publish? Yes, yeah, so, okay. yeah, thank you for that question. When we um, look to develop subsequent publications from the LAC trial, the first priority was this one, to publish on the oncologic outcomes. Then the second priority that we're working on manuscripts now, and actually one of them has already been submitted, is the comparison of complications, one group versus the other. Um, and then the subsequent publication is the quality of life because we had a very extensive quality of life assessment. So our team of statisticians, we're lining up a set of priorities. So oncologic paper first, complication second, quality of life after that. And then any other analyses that anyone wants to look at from the LAC trial data, you can submit, and you can certainly write to me, um, you can submit a, a proposal to the trial management committee that you want to look into this data. And we have already had a, a proposal for, for a group that wants to look at manipulator versus no manipulator for, for the LAC trial. Thank you. Thank you for excellent presentation. I have a question to Christopher. Um, what's the duration of your modified operation? Duration time of operation. Time. Yes, duration time. Um, uh, this is a good question. Duration time, the average duration time. Sorry, microphone. So the average uh, surgical time is between three and a half and four hours, but depends mainly on the result of the frozen section. Because we don't go to the vaginal route or we don't start with the vaginal incision until we get the result of the last frozen section from the pathologist. And this is very often our time factor because it can take up to 30, 40 minutes if we get the last result. And we strictly stop and, and wait, wait until we have this result. So this is often a an, an, an factor that we cannot influence during our surgery. But uh, again, the, the, the main surgical time is between three and a half and four hours including this waiting time for frozen section. And coming back to, I totally agree, level, eins, level one evidence is level one evidence of a perfect trial. There's no doubt about it. And uh, uh, according, because we don't believe in this technique of a total laparoscopic and, uh, 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 and of course a little bit in, in our data of more than 400 patients with a follow-up of nine years, a mean follow-up, some patients have 24 years follow-up, uh, we, we have decided to give both 
publications to the patients, and she has to make the decisions if she agrees for the one or the one. I agree with you sometimes. I can be with the open surgery a little bit faster. So for me, it doesn't make any difference if I do the open or the minimal invasive. It's up to the patient to decide if he wants to have yeah. the benefits or not. One thing, though, that I would add to that, uh, Chris, and thank you, you know, certainly very, uh, tremendous value to your study. Um, but I think that there's a potential danger in saying, I'm going to show the patient's data and then let the patients decide. Because often the patient doesn't have the academic knowledge of scrutiny to look at the difference between the studies. And if we were to, for example, share the LAC trial with your study, the patients would not know that every patient in your study had a frozen section evaluation for the lymph nodes, and if the lymph nodes were positive, then the patients didn't have that procedure. So therefore, certainly, it's a very different patient population. And also, I think that when we say, well, I'm just going to let the patients make a decision, we can find always papers, retrospective papers that agree with what we're want, wanting to do. But I think it's very important to highlight, and particularly I just want to make this point before we conclude, is that often the question comes up is, well, why is it that when we look at retrospective data, there is no difference? And one of the things that I would ask and highlight is that all retrospective data is sequential, not concurrent. A prospective randomized trial is concurrent. One patient gets open, one patient gets minimally invasive, another patient gets open at the same time frame in the same time period. For retrospective studies, if you look consistently, if you look at your own data in your institution, we looked at MD Anderson data, there was no difference because it's all sequential. And what that means is that from 1990 until 2005, Everybody was doing open, 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 open. 2005, surgeons go get trained. They become proficient in minimally invasive surgery. No one does open anymore. And in your hospital's experience, is laparoscopy, 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 laparoscopy. This group here, if you look, and I ask you to look at the methods and the results of retrospective data, this group here, 1B2 tumors, tumors greater than five centimeters, tumors that have positive parametrial involvement, higher rate, not that every patient is in that group, but higher rate of patients with worse profiles. And if you look at this group here, it's patients who are highly selected, you used an MRI, you used a PET scan, you made sure you got rid of patients that have positive lymph nodes, got rid of patients that have parametrial involvement. If this group needed adjuvant treatment, they got chemotherapy and radiation, a treatment that we know is better. If this group needed adjuvant treatment, they just got radiation, a treatment that we know is inferior. We look at the follow-up of this group. The median follow-up of this group is eight to 10 years. The median follow-up of this group, when you look at retrospective studies, is two years, three years. So there's not enough time for recurrences to show up in this group. And no one, no one has questioned, why does this group that is a much more unfavorable group, do the same at this group that is very, very favorable. No one questioned what's wrong with this group that when we look at oncologic outcomes, the results are the same. And I think that what this study has revealed is that the minimally invasive surgery potentially has an unfavorable effect that brings this very favorable group to the same level as a very unfavorable group. So I think that, you know, by saying, well, look, we, we, we have seen a retrospective study and there's no difference. Look at those details. You're looking at patients that are very, very different. They're not patients that are compared like this. It's patients that are compared like this. <clears throat> Thank you. Can I ask you, Professor Keller, uh, uh, you showed your uh, excellent data. Uh, did, did you have the possibility to compare uh, this group of patients with the group of patients uh, with open surgery from your clinic? No, no, no. Exactly, that's a problem because we, with, with the early beginning, when we started with the procedure, we didn't do any open. There were only a few cases where we perform, have performed an open radical, only if anesthesia didn't agree with, with, with the laparoscopy or Trendelenburg position or so. But again, this is rather a pro because we didn't bias the patient a few bad cases to, to, to the open uh, surgery and the other for minimal invasive. All consecutive patients from 2004 with these inclusion criteria up to 2018 have been operated by a minimal invasive approach with this technique. 
You know, one other thing that I wanted to add, and I know that obviously the session is running long, is that you, you also need to evaluate value of data that is analyzed. And when you're looking at a prospective randomized trial, there's a team of individuals who are constantly looking at the data. They're auditing the data. There's a regulatory process for that data. And there's checking of source documents. In other words, if Dr. Ramont enters that the patient is a 1B1 with a tumor less than two centimeters, there's somebody that actually goes to the pathology report and says, yes, it is a 1B1 that is less than two centimeters, and yes, it is an adenosquamous carcinoma. That's a prospective randomized trial quality of data. Retrospective studies often are a database in a hospital just as we are, a database in a hospital that often is a fellow or a research data coordinator or even a faculty. But how many times when we have these retrospective data collections on an Excel database or whatever other kind of database, how many times do we go back and check that the medical student, other fellow, other resident entered that this was in fact an adenosquamous carcinoma, that this was in fact a tumor that was three centimeters, that this was in fact a tumor that showed no evidence of disease in the lymph nodes. So that gives you also a sense of the quality of data when we say retrospective data is just as good as prospective. Be careful in making that assumption. Last small question. What, um, can, you, uh, can, you, can you tell us the, the level of compliance? Uh, were they comparable, for example, if uh, uh, on the, the period when randomization, so uh, the patient was, uh, she, she was, took the envelope and she says, it's, I'm for open surgery. Yeah. I don't want to go and she's going, I'm going out from this clinic. Uh, what was the percentage of uh, these in open and endoscopic? Because yes. we know that the patients sometimes they're going on mm -hmm. doctor and they are not agreeing uh, with yeah. this uh, and sure. they're going out. So the percentage of uh, this compliance, it was six percent that the surgery was uh, not uh, done in the in the open surgery group and four percent in the minimally invasive group where they changed their mind. Mm -hmm.